Can you hear me okay? People on the back? Excellent. So first, I would like to remind everyone to please ask questions. And uh, uh, in order to be able for me to hear you better, this time we'll just give people a microphone. Let's see how that turned out. Okay, so we'll, um, that's ho hopefully that will help with the mask and everything, so. Now, first I would like to talk a little bit more about this project because the, I know some people already ask questions. The idea here is to get the broader perspectives of the really the main goal of particle physics. So to learn more about the universe and to really understand fundamental physics laws. And, and yesterday we discussed this a lot of really outstanding fundamental physics questions. However, this is a very daunting task. Let's say that your group decides, okay, we want to find dark matter or understand matter of dark energy. And unless this is specifically your research, you might wonder where would you start to finding information about like what are the possible solutions. And the reason why I gave this project is because all this material has been prepared for you by 3,000 particle physicists in the United States. So United States, every eight years, has a very unusual process, which for historical reasons called snow mass. And if anyone may know, snow mass is a fairly famous ski resort. So uh, the very first one of those have been at the ski resort. Uh, and ever since, this process has been called snow mass. So it takes a whole year, and the way it's done, at least the way, and it takes about, uh, I think, uh, happens about every eight to 10 years. And the goal of it, it's inform really the funding agencies what the particle physics should do in the US for the next 10 years, and that also includes international collaborations. And while, as I said, it's been focused on the US, what it does, it really talks about what are the unsolved problems and how we would like to solve them. And this is a very structured effort. And uh, the entire particle physics is separated to frontiers. So there is an energy frontier which talks about accelerator physics. Then there is an instrumentation frontier which talks about various detectors now including quantum sensors. There is neutrino frontier, there is a theory frontier. There is uh, also a rare and precision experiments frontier, and there is a cosmic frontier which includes dark matter, dark energy, inflation, and those topics. So there are 10 frontiers. And then each frontier has uh, subtopics. For example, dark matter has subtopic of particle dark matter and wave dark matter. And theory, for example, has you know EFT as a separate topic. And uh, each of those divisions has conveners which then get the community response and produce white papers. So first there are letters of intense white papers, but the result of this, that each one of those subcommittees has a document which says for every part what they think be important for the next 10 years. And then they get reduced for the entire frontier document and then to the single book. So what I did, I gave you the link in that website which I make to all those documents so you don't have to search for them. Uh, of course, there is no expectation that you read a 100-page document. However, they nicely are required to have three-page executive summary. And I wanted to show you where those links are. And that's kind of the place for you to start. Because if you're interested in the solving problem for neutrino masses, I mean, you can start by just reading the summary of what possible suggestions are to solve the problems of neutrino masses, for example, or actually to study neutrinos. So let me switch. Out of it. So as I've said, uh, this is just my uh, group website. Oh, sorry. Let me shift this. So this is just my group website. It's simply my name, marianasafranova.com, uh, which you can actually look in the program for my name. And then all you do is slash GGI, or you can just access it here. And this is specifically done for you. So first, you can actually get the lecture notes. Oh, I'm sorry, it started downloading. OK. And then this actually be uh, links for today's lecture, since we haven't quite finished lecture one last time. 
And then also, this is actually a special session, uh, special issue on the fundament, uh, on the quantum sensors. But me, and this is uh, actually a project as I showed before. And then here is a description of snow mass. If you want to actually interest about process, you can read about it here. And of course, Europe also has different, uh, a different type of process. So uh, I'm not familiar with the European process, so that's why I'm using the US one. So first, if you're interested of not reading by, but listening, click on this link. So essentially, as the entire highlights of all the documents, it's uh, given by the conveners. This is the hour and 40 minutes video, which has presentations which are summary from every single one of those frontiers. So you can just simply listen for people give summary to your resident, read about it. And this is just an example of a report from one of those projects. But mainly then, uh, and here are also talks from like on dark matter, there is this theory frontier conference, which actually has 50 talks on different subject, also has links to everything. So there is enormous amount of material there. And also it's very easy to select because if you're interested in neutrinos, just look at the, you know, the one which says neutrino frontier, interested in dark matter, just look at the one which says cosmic frontier. And here is a link to actual documents. For example, here is the energy report. And I think I already opened it, so we don't have to actually open it. So here is the energy frontier report. And as you see, there is executive summary. When we get all past the others. which essentially ex explores all the possible collider visions, what those colliders will do. Uh, also, for example, here is a very nice big questions for the energy frontier. And here is like all the different things you can study there. And here, if people are interested, uh, I think there is a, actually a list. Here's the benchmarks for all the possible colliders which are future colliders. So if you're interested, for example, in problems which can be solved with accelerator physics, that would be kind of a way to start. So I didn't give you just project and just go and find things somewhere. I gave it to you because there is a, just a fantastic opportunity that only happen, happens once eight or 10 years. So this is exactly current. The process just finished uh, this year. And then, for example, if you go to a different one, uh, that would actually be a cosmic frontier. That would have actually the summary of all the dark matter searches. And actually it has a list of all the questions, all the opportunities, uh, as you see. And uh, for example, here is the list of everything, a study inflation and dark energy of all the possible future experiments for like next 20 to 30 years. And the dark matter searches actually kind of outlines that's where we are and that's where we want to be. So as you see, there is a fantastic uh, <clears throat> amount of very highly condensed information in there. So if you're interested, and I think you should be interested, what happens in particle physics in general, beyond the particular thing which you are working on, this is kind of a unique opportunity to actually take a look. And this is mostly written with a peop in mind that there will be a final committee, which is called the P5, which is going to look at all of this and actually make the finding decisions afterwards for the U.S. for the next 10 years. And that includes also participation in the UN, U.S. in the CERN projects and neutrino projects, etc. Okay, so this is kind of idea where to start. Uh, how many people form team? Uh, raise your hand if you are a member of a team. Fantastic. Okay, so it looks like you are well underway. And we will have a discussion section today, so if you have any questions, that will be uh, like where we can talk about uh, either this project. Uh, if you want to actually any specific information, I can point you towards the right uh, place. But also you can just go to archive and search like by the name of the sub-frontier. So in the snowmass.org just has a list of everything. The theory is particularly interested. Uh, the reason why there is specif specific theory frontier is that the last time, theory did not get listed as a priority by the P5 team. And that upset a lot of people. So, so now theory has like 13 different subsections and uh, uh, there is a you know, very prominent both computational part and the like really theory developing of phenomenology part, et cetera. So if you're interested in phenomenology, there is a separate document just on phenomenology. I also put you a separate document on small experiments since I will actually talk about the EDMs. Questions? Okay. So
So uh, think about questions. We'll have the separate discussion section for 30. And now there is time actually to start talking about the tabletop experiments and what specifically we would like to discover with them. And you see some of the puzzles coming from tabletop experiments the last time. And uh, this time, I first would like to start as to why are we here in terms of why we're actually discussing those quantum technologies and quantum sensors, and what really happened in the past 20 years in atomic physics, which is my field, for it to be able to contribute to the particle physics. Okay, so why atoms? Well, the first thing is that atoms have extremely good theoretical description. So what I do in my uh, life when I don't look how to search for dark matter, we compute properties of atoms. And this is essentially quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics works fantastically for the atomic systems. And unlike the nuclear physics, where there is no mean field in atoms, you can always describe them there is a nuclei, and then there are electrons which are, have closed shells, and then there are some electrons which are not in closed shells, meaning that you have a mean field description of atoms from which you can start. And then you only have to describe the atomic correlations which are on top of the description. It's still very, very hard to actually compute properties of complicated systems. For example, we still can't really compute properties of iron, for example, very well, or things like you know, Californium. However, the alkali is alkaline earths, which are mostly used by precision experiments, actually have very good fantastic theoretical description. And in many cases, we can predict the properties to like a percent or half a percent. More than that, we can actually tell how accurate the numbers are. And all this progress led to the point that now people were able to actually laser cool atoms. And the way you do it is that let's say you have an atom. And the problem of using atoms, like say, in this room for precision measurements, it's the fact that they move too fast. They're also not right atoms. So and for the longest time, what people were doing, they were just you know, getting a sample of atom, and there is a place where you can like, literally order online uh, whatever, say, cesium, or specific isotope. And then they will put it in the oven, and they make atoms hot, and they actually then put the atoms in the beam. And all the measurements were in the beam of atoms, which moves pretty fast. This is really, people have done precision measurements with this. In fact, the most precise parity violation experiments have been still done in atomic beams. But this is not suitable for, say, quantum formation. Because there is just no way that you can make a qubit out of these atoms where you precisely control whether the atom in this state or this state if the atom moves too fast. For first, you just don't know where to point your laser, and the second, it moves too fast. Because and if it moves too fast, there is a Doppler shift. So the first thing pe people did, and actually the 1997 Nobel Prize was obtained for the issue of the concept of laser cooling. So what they do, they shine a laser beam. Let's say your atom moves this direction and then your uh, laser light is moved this direction. What happens? If it's about on the resonance with atomic transitions, so zero to one, what it does? It absorbs the atom. It absorbs the And when it absorbs the photon, what does it do? It gets momentum kick. So its velocity is slightly reduced. So essentially what it does, it slows down the beam of atoms. Well, but then the photon gets re-emitted, but it always absorbed in this direction. But when it's re-emitted, it actually is remitted anywhere in 360 degrees, right? So effectively, you actually cool down the atoms this way because it always gets momentum kick in one direction, but when it emits a photon, it gets it in a random direction. So the only problem, obviously, is that eventually you get off resonance because uh, the, it slows down, and then it get Doppler shift gets different, and then you're no longer in resonance. So what people eventually did, they actually uh, put atoms in a case so you actually have a counter-propagating laser beams. And uh, you also can actually adjust the frequency of your laser. You know that when the atom actually gets cooled, you uh, change the frequency of the laser. And so it actually gets, it adapts for the change in Doppler shifts and gets colder and colder. There is a limit to which you can actually get this. And then an absolutely fantastic result was when people sort out how to measure the temperature of atoms. Because it's really not easy to find out what is the temperature of atoms. So essentially, they make atomic clouds, they let it go, and they, you see how fast it expands. 
So that's how you measure temperature, because you essentially measure kinetic energy. They found that this procedure get at a much colder than it should have been. Can you imagine you do experiment and it works better, much better than you ever expected it to be? And for, long, for some time, people didn't understand why. It turns out to be that uh, they ended up with doing accidentally something called Sisyphus cooling, is that uh, every time they actually do that, the atom was actually get also a transition to a different state, and then every time it was doing it, it was remitting, it was actually losing, losing energy. So it's like the Sisyphus cooling, meaning it's like you always push the kind of the boulder on top of the hill, and that's what the atoms were doing. So, and that's what people got Nobel Prize for, uh, for explaining how this works. But for us, what we care about, that eventually people were able to make atoms cold. And when we say cold, we mean that they went from 300 Kelvin, and now you can actually get to pick a Kelvin. So at that point, those atoms are essentially stationary. So why do we care about stopping atoms? Because neutral atoms are very, very difficult to trap. Ions are a bit simpler to trap, so you need to cool down the ions, and just to remind, ion it's when you tear an electron off the atom. So stopping the atoms removed a significant amount of energy from them, so meaning you can put them in very small potentials. So as a result, people were able to create a standing wave potential, again, just counterpropagating laser beams make a standing wave, and we're able to put atoms literally in this actual potential. You can do it in one dimension, two dimension, three dimension. And at, now your atoms are on, not only cold, but they're also trapped. And that's really what enabled both precision measurement and quantum formation. Because now, first, you know exactly where the atoms are, and then they also are very, very cold. You can also make potentials in such a way that this process, the tunneling, is almost completely prohibited. So all you need to do is just increase the intensity of your laser beam and the potential goes up. Or then you can bring it down and the whole thing diffuse, and essentially you get the Bose-Einstein condensate, which is like one wave. And in 2001, people actually get prize for demonstrating a Bose-Einstein condensate. And it was kind of a bit of a funny story here. Uh, in 1997, the Bose-Einstein condensation already been done for two years, so it was in 1995. So there was a conference, and they knew that Nobel Prize announcement was going to be there. People were sure that they will get a prize for Bose-Einstein condensate, and they actually got for the laser cooling, and they embossed BEC was actually later. People like had like speeches prepared uh, at that point. So, uh, and they like literally waited till 3 a.m. to see who gets the Nobel Prize that year. So it was, it was quite a funny story. So, uh, but the next stage was quantum control. So it's not enough to cool the atom and trap them. You also need to be able to precisely control what state the atom is in. So what people were actually able to do is that now let's say the Let's say it takes the atom of rubidium. And rubidium and alkali, so your ground state is 5s. Uh, I don't know if people remember the electronic designations. This is a principal quantum number, and this is the orbital quantum number. S means it's L is 0, and the total J is 1 half. And then the next state would be 5p 1 half, and that all it means. And then there are lots of other electrons, but they're all closed shells. There's only one electron which is outside. So any questions on the designations? Because I will use them like every once in a while. And probably people have not seen them in a while. OK, so this transition is very, very fast. So you can use this transition for laser cooling. For laser cooling, you would like to be able to use those actually strong transitions. So um, in this case, what you should be able to do is, for example, this will split into the two hyperfine state. Remember we talked yesterday about two, uh, the 25 centimeter line of hydrogen. That's a splitting of hyperfine splitting. It happens because your electron interacts with a nuclear moment. So the total moment, it's I plus J. So this is nuclear, this is electron. And the total moment, therefore, would depend on the nuclear spin. And rubidium has either 5 half or 5 half or 3 half nuclear spin. This has 1 half and this is 5 half. So you can actually have several levels as a result. And right now, what people can do, they can put atoms in exact superposition. So for example, 50% this one and 50% that one. And this can be controlled 
uh, at the level of uh, many significant figures. So in terms of quantum formation, this is definition of a single qubit quantum gate. So being able to really control quantum superposition. And uh, people can also make those entangled systems. For example, in ions or in atoms, but in ions is somewhat easier because ions are trapped like in a chain like this. So you can actually, for example, entangle this ion and that ion, and you really can build this quantum wave functions, the zero, zero plus one, one. And that would be, for example, zero would be this, and one, for example, would be that. Uh, in some of the states, for example, if we switch to, say, Stronsum plus, the ground state would still be 5s, but the next state is actually 4d, three half, and that actually lives for, uh, for nearly half a second. So you have those metastable states, which could be used as memory. The reason why all of this is important is that suddenly people realize you can actually build quantum computers based on atoms and ions. And that uh, pulled enormous amount of money into the quant quantum computing, quantum sensors, and as a byproduct of this, it also pulled money into the ability of precisely control atoms, and uh, as this is actually why we end up to the point that we can so precisely control atoms and measure the phase, the frequency, magnetic fields, electric fields to such a degree, we can actually test the postures of fundamental physics. So now the quantum sensing branched in the own uh, right, and this would actually bring us opportunity to contribute to the high energy physics because the precision got to the such extreme point. So its ability to make atoms and ions very cold, trapped, and precisely controlled. If you're interested in the level of building quantum computers, uh, I have, uh, if actually you go to my website and then go to lecture notes, there is a course 650, which is entire 20 lectures on quantum computing, if you're ever interested about that. That's an incoming uh, graduate course, so for people who actually don't know quantum mechanics, because uh, we have uh, computer scientists who take this, and uh, that has everything about quantum algorithms, uh, which you want to know, and about actually laser coolings and everything, if you're interested. Questions? Yes. Okay. So to avoid the tunneling, you have to make it energetically very difficult to tunnel. So uh, right. So the way this is controlled is by increasing intensity of your laser, because it literally, what it is, it's stark shift. So remember, if you put uh, from your quantum mechanics courses, if you put atom on electric field that there is a change in energy, which is uh, minus one half atomic polarizability and essentially intensity of your laser. That delta energy is this. All it is, it's a stark shift. If it's high enough, then... Yes, if it's high enough that the tunneling would essentially be prohibited. Uh, interesting things happen. What turns out that phase transition actually happens. Because normally, let's say you have uh, a lattice, and that's those things called optical lattices. It's literally the crystal of made of light. So, if you allow tunneling, then you really don't know where the atoms are. So you can either know the phase or the number of atoms, but not both. Let's say now you ramp the lattice. What eventually happens, it's a mod called mod insulator transition. So it's actually a, qu it's a quantum phase transition. So what happens is suddenly, the atomic population redistributes when you actually ramp it high enough. And I remember like that year when they first done it, like every single atomic talk, that's all you see, it's interference pattern. They actually were able to prove it because if you actually allow tunneling, that you see interference patterns for when you split those things. If the tunnel is prohibited, the, that the interference pattern forces away. So that's how we're able to prove it. But the interesting byproduct of this, that if you have a, like a lattice like this, and many, many uh, of those atoms sitting there, the question is where atoms are going to be, because you generally want to have one atom per site. So with modern solitary transition, what happens is that you end up with atoms, like some of the part would be totally unpopulated, and then the rest of it will be populated with one atom per site, and then the rest by two atoms per site, and so on. So this way you can actually load a one atom per site in those lattices.
There is also a different strategy because the one thing with optical lattices is the atoms are pretty close because the distance between lattice sites is half the wavelength of your laser which you used to trap. So it's about like a 500 nanometer if you use a 1,000 nanometer laser. So generally, in many applications, you don't want atom be that close because then it's fairly high to actually fully suppress interactions unless you go this mode insulating mode. So what people have now done, and that's actually a fantastic distribution also, that you can actually manufacture those traps which are separated by, say, microns. And in this case, you can literally just take an atom by what's called an optical tweezer, which is a laser beam, and you can put it and plug it in a specific lattice site. And for a while, all the conferences uh, had like, you know, Eiffel Tower pictures and atoms. Or like they will could uh, literally spell the word, the word quantum in atoms. Because one issue, if you actually raise the barrier too high, if you raise the barrier very high, that means you're actually putting a lot of laser light. And that, it means you actually start hitting your lattice because you're scattering a lot of photons. So that's a bit of a problem with actually raising it too high as well. So, questions? So and I, I do have a laser cooling lecture in my actual quantum formation course. If anything, anyone interested, I can tell you exactly the number for it. So, uh, or you can just go and uh, search for it. Uh, all the lecture names are written down. For us right now, uh, we are not interested maybe for precision measurement or specific procedures, uh, but we are interested that that essentially what realizes the potentials. The other possibility would be if we can do this for molecules. Because for many experiments, molecules actually have properties atoms would not have. For example, you can fully polarize some molecules. Polarizing atoms, <clears throat> uh, it, it's, it, it's not as easy. And the EDM experiment is actually better done with molecules. The technology is almost there, but not quite. So we can laser cool some molecules, but unfortunately molecules, remember, they have uh, electronic levels, rotational levels, vibrational levels. It's very hard to make sure all molecules are in the right state. So there are only very few specific molecules uh, which have, uh, you know, for example, large what's called frank condon factor, which you can actually laser cool because the number of repumping lasers. And what the repumping laser is, is this. So let's say that you have your atom here in this first state. And now there are many, many other states, and let's say you start to actually cool them down, but let's say your atom's stuck like right here. So you need a laser which should be able to efficiently actually put it back down. And for molecules, the number of those lasers is high. So, but uh, people have successfully demonstrated molecular laser cooling uh, very recently, and they can actually literally, they can take two atoms and make a molecule out of them by photo association by light. So the technology has become incredible. And as a result, we actually have atomic clocks, which can measure time and frequency precisely, atom interferometers, which can make phase pre measure phase precisely, which means you can measure acceleration. And that means you can do like equivalence principle tests. And then you have magnetometers which measure magnetic fields precisely. The trapped ions can also measure electric fields to extreme precision to the point you can actually look for dark photons with them. So, and this is why we are here. This extraordinary advances means that we actually have uh, quantum sensors which you can measure fundamental symmetry, like looking at fundamental symmetries, you can look at the position invariance, Lorentz invariance, you can search for dark matter, and we'll start with dark matter searches. And uh, uh, you can also even actually look for things like sterile neutrinos. You can like wonder how you can look for that with atoms. It's because you can actually use radioactive atoms in the strap, and you understand the processes so well, when the nuclei actually decays, you can actually get that outgoing energy so precisely you can actually get neutrino energy spectrum. And then if there is a bump on it, that's your signature for sterile neutrino. It's called the Hunter experiment, and in fact, I actually provided a link to this uh, focus issue on new physics quantum discovery with new quantum sensors, and there is a Hunter experiment paper in there if anyone interested. Also, people think with uh, different technologies, <clears throat> uh, with what's called NV centers, you can actually do directional WIMP detection originally, uh, eventually. So if you're interested, I can talk about that one. But today, I will first would like you to give an overview of the scope of that entire effort. I'll just go on to show you only two slides, and then we'll talk about dark matter and why those quantum sensors can detect dark matter. So,
So first, the resources. If you would like to read more about any of this, oh, and by the way, here are how the traps look like, like a pictures. It's always nice to show pictures. So here, for example, what you see are trapped ions, and generally those are trapped in a linear chain. So you can literally access every one of those ions by a laser. Here's this optical lattice, and you can actually do, put different atoms or spins, and here is actually a three-dimensional optical lattice. You literally have one atom held by light in there. That's exactly what it looks like. And actually, you can make those things large. One-dimensional lattices, they can make them one centimeter. So you can actually have uh, 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 microscopic sort of quantum superpositions. In atom interferometers, they were able to actually separate quantum wave function by a meter and actually recombine it back. Uh, and uh, now they're actually building the one for the 100 meters right now, so 100 meter atom interferometers. So what you actually literally see is a, a quantum, uh, qu quantum crystal. And this is ideal crystal. This is exactly, you can make imperfection of it, but essentially you're just holding atoms by light because you have three six beams, uh, one in the x direction, two in the x direction, two in the y direction, two in the z direction. They can be all produced by the same laser. Okay, so now, if you're also interested what the quantum sensor is, uh, I generally mean quantum sensor very broadly. Uh, and uh, a while ago, myself and Dima Butker, we put together this focus issue in uh, quantum science and technology. There are about 20 papers. I did provide the links to this on the site, so you can explore those papers. A lot of those on Axion, Dark Matter, but uh, many of them are on the various like fifth force searches uh, the, in the EDMs, and this is a Hunter experiment. And uh, uh, there is also the one on Envy Centers for uh, VIMP dark matter searches as well. So, and we decided that we will take a broad view that if the sensor has to be described, if any technology has to be described by quantum mechanics, we consider it quantum. If the classical descri description is not appropriate. And therefore, the quantum sensor means that the capability, the measurement capability of this device are enabled by our ability to manipulate the quantum states and read, the, read them out of the superposition. So again, the requirements manipulation and the readout, and uh, this means that spectrometer is not a quantum sensor, but atomic clock is. And again, different people have different definitions, but I will use a quantum sensor in this field that it's any type of technology when we actually have control of quantum states for measurement purposes. And now, um, about uh, five years ago now, we noticed with my colleagues that there is a much increased effort in the searches for new physics with atoms and molecules. So there is a review for modern physics. Again, it's linked on that website. That's almost like 100 pages with 1,100 references. And that literally reviews the entire field, so this is one way to start if you're interested in it. And uh, as you see, there is a wide, way, sco wide scope of AMO new physics searches. Now, if you're interested in any specific topics here, let me know. I can make the last lecture on whatever topic you prefer. Uh, I plan to talk more about variation of fundamental constants uh, than... I will talk about the dark matter searches. I will start with light dark matter. I will talk about EDMs just because this is such a fantastic signature for new physics. This is one of the most likeliest places new physics can come from. If I have time, I will talk about Lorentz symmetry uh, and a little bit on gravitational wave detection as well. So, but if you're interested in any specific subtopics, send me an email or just chat with me uh, in the corridor or during lunch or breakfast. Okay, and uh, here, uh, is my attempt to create a list. At some point, CERN has this um, meeting on physics beyond colliders, and they would like, they asked me to actually put like all the effort on one slide. I said, no. They said, okay, two slides. <laughs> okay, so here's my effort for the CERN uh, <coughs> workshop um, on the future planning to put all the AMO effort on two slides. Okay, I don't know if you can see much, but so those are searches for electron and electric dipole moment. This is one of the highest chance to see new physics because right now all those searches are well within what's what actually 
prescribed by supersymmetry and uh, by similar models. In fact, they are already in many cases way beyond what LHC can see. And the fact that they haven't seen anything is troubling. They also improve an order of magnitude in five years. And eventually uh, there is like three orders of magnitude improvement possible within 15 years at this point. So this is one of the highest chance of seeing new physics. And I'll talk about those. Then there are searches for hadronic EDMs. Hadronic EDMs are harder to interpret. Here we know exactly how to rescale from molecules to the uh, actual fundamental electron EDMs. There is also in high inspirity violation with a clever name zombies, <laughs> also with molecules. And there is a very much clock effort. So the clock so far has been used for search for variation of fundamental constants, look for scalar dark matter of different kinds, test general relativity, look at time dilation, search for uh, violation of equivalence principle and for Lorentz violation. In fact, the best limits on Lorentz violation with the electron comes from clocks. And those clocks are so precise, they will not lose one second in over the lifetime of the universe at this point. 18 significant figures. It's the most precise quantity measured on Earth. That's about eight orders better than GPS. <laughs> okay, but if you ever use a GPS, you use the atomic clock. That's what's in space. Okay, uh, and there are many things coming. I will talk a little bit about nuclear clock. Uh, there is a single nuclei which you can excite transition by laser. Oh, by the way, it's a good question for you. So why are we using atomic transitions? Why is there a problem of using nuclear transitions actually as a basis for frequency standards? So why atomic transitions? Why not nuclei? Yes. Yes, so the energy of the nuclear transitions is like MEV to KEV. And uh, we all discussed that to build a clock, you need to actually, mo you need to manipulate that transition by laser, as you see in all of those technologies. And there is even, I am not optimistic that I will see MEV lasers in my lifetime. So essentially there is a one transition, there is only one known nuclear transition in EV scale, at 8 EV, one. And we don't know why. Nuclear physics can't compute it. It's just a freak of nature. Things accidentally cancel. Somehow the, uh, the strong interaction canceled the Coulomb interaction and got it for two states and got down to nearly zero. So it's really a cancellation of GeV energies to like EV scale, which is amazing. So we actually funded to build a nuclear clock. I will tell you why we want this. This is going to be the best dark matter, ultralight dark matter, scalar dark matter search device you can build. And the cost is like, we got 15, uh, you know, 13 million euro from the uh, ERC for that, to build prototypes. And it's a very ambitious project because right now the number of digits, we know the energy of this clock is exactly two, and we promised 15 digits in six years. So, but there is again, all of it, it's about building lasers. Okay, so that's about clocks, that's my first page. And then uh, there is also many other experiments. Now, those ones are atom interferometry experiments. So they're prototype gravitational wave detection. So atom interferometry also can actually do stuff clocks can do, look for variation of fundamental constants, but they are much better in looking for violation of equivalence principle. They are much better for gravity tests because for all purposes, they are accelerators. And uh, this topic of my talks is tabletop experiments. This is the first experiment on EMO physics, you know, besides the ones uh, which involved anti-hydrogen, which is actually no longer tabletop. This is a 100 meter device being built in Fermilab. It actually goes into the shaft of the old neutrino experiment, like where the under, uh, be, uh, access to the old neutrino experiments. If the idea is to use actually it for gravitation wave detection, if this is successful, then the prototype would be uh, next to be 100 kilometer of, <laughs> or one kilometer uh, in the uh, Sanford facility, so. And it's interesting always to talk, you know, for the particle theorist and experimentalist, I talked Peter Graham and I heard Peter Graham, and he's like, okay, you're going to like build a four kilometer one. And it's like, is there is no four kilometer shaft like anywhere. So, okay, we'll build a one kilometer one. So, so one kilometer could potentially already detect gravitational waves, but eventually those will have to be in space. The reason why we want to use atoms rather than just lasers for the gravitation wave detection is that the LIGA is just cannot see any gravitational wave which are below 10 hertz because of Earth seismic activity. You can build it on the moon 
And people have suggested building those things on the moon, by the way, because on the moon, the seismic activity is much, much, much smaller. But the atom interferometers are actually not sensitive to the seismic activity. They're only sensitive to the gradient of the potential. So, and there is a hope that they actually uh, could go to the decahertz range, but eventually they actually will have to be in space as well. So the technology is kind of, you know, right now this is a prototype. And uh, I believe uh, Europe is building the one in France called MIGA, and that's a hybrid one, and it's a horizontal one. Uh, uh, UK is building iron, and uh, China built Zyger. So those things are no longer tabletop. It's really atom interferometry on a huge scale. And it's an interesting challenge for my field because we, haven't, we are not used to operate in large collaborations. It's really a novel thing for us. We're also not used to experiments which cost more than $10 million or actually more than one million. So that's going to be an interesting new thing. Because unlike particle physics, my field does not prioritize. We are specific that actually we will not prioritize and uh, people will just apply for funding for whatever they actually want to do. Which is a very different way of thinking. And also it makes experiments very fast. Like we published a proposal on Tesla Lorentz violation, people got money six months later and now they build the experiment. Also, a lot of those devices are built for completely different reasons. They initially were built as really sensors uh, by Metrology Institute and other institutions. And now, imagine that your dark matter device is already built for you. You just need to figure out how to use it. So it's a very different paradigm. And now we went from the devices which were built for other purposes to more dedicated experiments, as you see. So next, here are various dark matter searches. And of course, the most important, they are action and ALP searches. How, who knows what QCD action is? Okay, so it's, it's the only best solution for the strong CP problem, which we listed yesterday, and that also can be 100% dark matter. And there are several experiments, microwave cavities, I will talk about actually those, and this is interesting fifth force version to search for it. And there are many other dark matter new force searches, you, uh, you've seen you can do it with clocks, and uh, you can do it with spectroscopy, you can actually do it with magnetometers, you can actually do it with levitated optomechanics, and this is really a fantastic thing. They can levitate like a physical nanosphere by light. So they can't, you don't just hold atom by light, you can actually hold a nanosphere by light. And that actually can be a dark matter detector, if it's, it's the most sensitive, um, really a gravity test measurement of this kind. It's sensitive to the point you can actually detect gravitational wave above the LIGO region, uh, and there's a prototype being built as well by just two nanospheres. And then also there are, uh, the oldest kind of uh, topic of the beyond the standard model of physics are tests of QED, and there you literally can actually measure and compute things to like 15 decimal figures, and you compare theory, computation, and different types of experiments to test uh, for the violations of QED. And like uh, G minus two, it's sort of, uh, uh, um, uh, atomic G minus two right now actually have about two sigma disagreement between different tests, but it's not really considered very serious at this point, so. And then there are the CPT tests, and there what you do, you compare properties of particles and antiparticles. For example, hydrogen, antihydrogen, proton, and antiproton, uh, and uh, that actually tests the CPT. And those are experiments which are actually not tabletop, they have to be conducted in CERN because you have to make antihydrogen uh, or end antiprotons. So, and then of course, uh, I run out of space, so there are many, many other experiments which I just, you know, didn't put a picture for. So as you see, this is an increasingly, exponentially increasing effort. And as you see, this is, can actually answer a lot of different fundamental problems. Because you can look, uh, there is actually, the, one of the best limit on dark energy for the symmetron type dark energy is actually done by atom interferometry. If you're interested in how that's done, we can talk at the, uh, discussion section. So this completes kind of overall review and now we'll get to dark, ultralight dark matter and I'll switch to actually blackboard and we'll do some actually exercises as well. So first, are there any questions uh, on, you know, those different types of experiments? So if you're interested in a specific experiment, I can talk about almost all of them. So let me know and send me an email and make sure you include it in the lectures. So for now, we'll include the dark matter searches and the EDMs and uh, some of the gravitational wave stuff.
Yes. Uh, this is a, a, a simply a very, very small particle. And they, they can be, uh, pre, so it, which is literally has a nano, uh, nanometer diameter, nanometer type diameter. So it's not an atom, it's just a very small thing. So it's, a, and uh, apparently they can manufacture those little things. So, and uh, um, uh, I know what, we have to see what exact diameter is, but essentially it's like a very little ball. It's a good question. I can check. Well, let, let me check with uh, uh, Andy Girassi in Northwestern. It's really leader, has a leadership role in there, but there's quite a lot of other people. So, but let me check on the, actually what they made them of. So. Other? Okay, and now to ultralight dark matter. So at this point I can, well, I can I guess keep it. I'll switch here. Okay, so what is our basic strategy for direct dark matter detection? If your dark matter is a particle, and we assume it interacts some way with the standard model, let's, let's take a WIMP. WIMP really has to interact with the standard model because in order for the WIMPs to actually uh, solve the hierarchy problem, because they are kind of connected to different issues, that we are assuming that there is a supersymmetry or a similar type of cases when you actually have some uh, symmetry and uh, you end up with a lighter supersymmetric super particle which has nothing uh, it can decay to. It ca it's not allowed to decay to standard model and it cannot decay to any other supersymmetric particle because it's the lightest one, it's prohibited. Therefore, it must be stable and it really could be, for example, neutralina. Uh, and uh, this is your kind of perfect dark matter. And the reason why it's so perfect is because it's produced thermally, okay? Have two electron positron pair in the early universe make two dark matter particles. So, so if you just rotate this process 90 degrees, that exact process means it has to scatter on the protons, electrons, and other standard model particles. So essentially, that thing hits your nuclei or hits an electron and deposits energy into your system. And that's a basic way you detect this. So let's say you have some presumably very large detector, if it's a liquid xenon or a smaller one, if those are solid state. But the basic idea, you have a detector and somewhere in there you have a nuclei, your dark matter comes, it scatters off, and that actually gets a uh, momentum kick. And as therefore, there is an energy deposition. And generally, your deposition would be you get either photons uh, or you get charge. So meaning that you actually ionized for electrons and the electrons floats uh, up and down. Or you can actually get heat. So, and uh, there are different detectors which can measure uh, one or two of those. And based on what type of, what mass of dark matter you have, uh, then you select which experiments you want to do. And this works to about like a well, to about like hundreds of GeVs normally to the TeV. Why? Because let's say your dark matter particle is one TeV, okay, your nuclear ice, for example, 100 GeV, so one TeV thing hitting a 100 GeV thing deposits sufficient energy for you to detect, right? So that's a basic idea. Now, it becomes a bit of a problem if this is one GeV, right? Because one GeV hitting 100 GeV or even 10 GeV, the energy deposition becomes smaller and smaller and more difficult to detect. So you end up with some uh, more elaborate ways to detect it. And one of the reasons why the whole dark matter field just completely blew up in the past 10 years, the people figured out first how to do it and how to produce much lighter dark matter, which is still produced thermally. The kind of M to, and you cannot actually produce a thermal if it's under MAV, but there are many scenarios now of why such dark matter would exist, and now we want to detect it. So one easy way to do it is say, okay, it doesn't hit nuclei, it hits an electron, and electron now it's only, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, 
much, much lighter. It's 2,000 times lighter than the nuclei. So now one GV thing hitting, you know, you know 0.5 MeV, that is something detectable. Uh, there is a more systematics here of what can happen to electrons, but uh, people are now building detector of detector based on electron scattering rather than on the uh, scattering from nucleons. But now, if you get even less energy deposition, what you can do, you can actually use uh, superconductors, direct materials, and uh, other different special materials. And uh, in this case, you can actually, what you do, you break Cooper pairs in superconductors, and that actually can look at EV type energy depositions. And you can look for the MEV scale or even KV scale dark matter with those. So this scenario that your dark matter hits something and either it's up and also the absorption scenario, but you just absorb it and uh, uh, then you actually uh, get uh, resulting, uh, look at the resulting energies. So there's absorption scenario, but eventually you look at the lighter and lighter dark matter and then something important happens. So when you cross about EV to 10 EV boundary, you actually start getting principally new way that dark matter interacts with your standard model. And that's what we'll talk about today. So when you're going from your TEV scale to the first GEV and then MEV and the KEV, you're pretty much still doing the same thing. You look at the energy which is deposited from either scattering or absorption. If you get down to the 10 EV, different things happen. And that's why we'll explain why then the quantum sensors are actually the best way to detect it. But let's actually do a few exercises. This are actually from the dark matter book. So, and I have linked it for you actually in the site. So uh, this is a fantastic new resource. So if you go right here, so I did put a link for you. The, uh, the book called The Search for Ultralight Bosonic Dark Matter. And it's actually a physical book, which is like a few hundred pages. It's actually a textbook, so the exercises with solutions. The greatest thing that uh, you can buy it for 50 bucks or you can download it for free. This is open access. Which is amazing. And uh, uh, Derek Kimball and Carmen Bieber, the editors, so the sections are written by different authors, but it's actually fantastically coherent. So today's lecture is actually from the chapter 1.4 uh, on specific properties of ultralight dark matter. So this is a great resource for you. So, first thing which you would like to consider. And uh, what is a maximum possible mass where the dark matter still can be fermionic in our galaxy? And that will bring us to why we're actually dealing with a list of, uh, uh, this interesting 10 AV barrier. Who can tell me what's the difference in terms of um, the proper basic properties of dark matter or galaxy, depending on the What? The statistic. statistic, right. But what will it affect? Because it has only yes. So you just can't pack too many fermions in our galaxy. And that means that there is a limit on the mass of fermionic dark matter. Why? Because then you make them actually faster and faster and faster because you have, a, you have to put them in the larger and larger and larger uh, energy levels. So eventually what happens, the speed of your fermionic dark matter exceeds the escape velocity of the galaxy. It just leaves, which meaning it actually can't really form clumps to make the galactic structures. So the question is, when does it happen? So the first thing which we have to now discuss is how is it actually dark matter doesn't collapse? 
Because when we are forming the galaxy, what does normal matter do? It collapses to a disk, right? Why can't, why dark matter does not collapse to a disk? Because dark matter is just one large blob around the disk. So why dark matter, okay, maybe it collapses a little bit, we are not exactly sure, but it's clearly still like a huge blob there. So why the normal matter can collapse to a disk but not dark matter in the Milky Way? Here, let me give whoever has an answer. Anyone? Anyone else? Okay, but what's the main reason why the normal matter collapses to a disk? What's a, what, what's a mechanism? What does it do? Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, so the galaxy. I think is it on? Well, yeah. Anyway, the galaxy is rotating, but the. Particles go like harmonic oscillators from one side to the other, and eventually they collide, and the velocities tend to average out on the rotation okay. perpendicular to the okay on the plane perpendicular to rotation. And so they but, but the important part that they can be cooled by radiation; they emit radiation. They can be radiatively cooled, and they lose the energy this way. Okay, so the dark matter can't radiatively cool for the obvious reason it doesn't. Re interact electromagnetically. And this is absolutely correct statement also that uh, the self-interactions technically can also uh, make it partially collapse, but there doesn't seem to be enough of them. So that's why dark matter sits the whole blob. By the way, the normal matter have trouble collapsing to a disk and not to a bar without dark matter. That's one of the actual reasons for initial dark matter hypothesis, because when people in the 80s start to do simulation of how to actually make a blob collapse to a disk because they found actually within one rotation it actually gets to a bar and not a disk. You actually do need the stabilizing part of dark matter to actually get a collapse to a disk and now our beautiful spiral galaxy. Okay, so now specifically the limits on the fermionic dark matter and then we'll go to the break. Okay, chalk. So first, a very simple estimate, why does the mass matter? The reason why the mass matter, let's say, okay, we have one fermionic particle per the de Broglie volume, right? So, okay, one. So here's the max density. One fermion per quantum state. And the de Broglie wavelengths, it's, well, it's a H divided by P, so it's inversely proportional to the mass. So therefore, the maximum density, plug in the de Broglie wavelengths in there, it's proportional to the mass divided by the de Broglie volume. And this is approximately proportional to the mass to the force. So when you actually then change the mass, you, with fermions, you end up with a too much density. So when actually those, therefore, it's clearly there has to be, if M is too small, then your maximum dark matter allowable density uh, will be different from what observed density, which is 0.4 GeV per centimeter cube. So this is kind of a hand-waving idea of why the mass actually matters for fermions in this regard. And now for the more exact computation, How do you derive a numerical value? Okay, you start with a differential, like how many particles do you have per phase space? And uh, let's remember we are talking about spin one half, uh, let's say we have uh, spin one half fermionic particle, it doesn't really matter, let's say we have two of them, and we have the volume and then we have momentum, and you need to divide by the Planck to the third. So this is number of quantum states you can actually have per, the phase, uh, per your phase space volume, right? And then all you have to do, just integrate over it, up to the maximum possible uh, Fermi momentum. And that's all you do. So number of quantum states, it's dn over the dv, and dv is just d3r. 
So when you divide by the volume, it actually goes away. Therefore, the maximum m, it's your integral from zero to the maximum momentum. You have two divided by the h cube, and all you have to do is just you have four pi and dp when you go from the three dimensions to one. And if you integrate this, you get eight pi uh, maximum momentum to the cubed. And this has to be less than dark matter density divided by the mass. And now we come to the limit that you should not exceed the escape velocity. And that limits what the PF can be. Because PF would then be a maximum possible momentum. And uh, the velocity of escape velocity of Milky Way, it's about 550 kilometers per second. And uh, we already started discussing that why doesn't matter collapse to a disk, but then why doesn't collapse at all? It's virally supported. So there is a dark matter spread velocity distribution of about 2, to minus, uh, two 300 kilometers per second, 10 to the minus 3 EV. So, and uh, the maximum, therefore, distribution cuts off at about 550. Therefore, there's a limit on what this number can be. And uh, PF, it's larger than escape velocity multiplied by the mass. And if you plug all of that in, then the minimum mass would be square root of 4, 3 h bar cubed divided by the a pi plug velocity in there to the third power escape velocity dm density again we assume that we know what the dm density is and this is about 10 av so in our galaxy we are not allowed to have fermionic dark matter if it's less than 10 electron volts so the entire ultralight dark matter after 10 av becomes bosonic and that really makes a difference because now you're allowed to have <clears throat> as many fermions as you, as many bosons as you want per your occupational volume. And next exercise which we'll do, we'll just see how many of them do we actually get. And uh, uh, when you go to break, when you come back, make sure you have some sort of a calculating device with you so you will actually do some numerical calculations. Because it's nice to be able to do kind of back and envelope estimate of what the properties of such ultra like dark matter could be. So let's make a break for about five minutes. Okay, uh, let's continue on the properties of ultralight bosonic dark matter. So uh, there were some interesting questions. So if you, please uh, come in with your questions or we have the discussion section. And the question was, uh, then at which point you actually are not allowed to have lighter and lighter masses, for example. In a certain point when you actually have a bosonic dark matter which is extremely light, this will actually affect the galactic scale structure. If you ever heard the term fuzzy dark matter, that's what it does. Because as we will see actually later, the wavelengths of such dark matter becomes the size of the galaxy. So it will start affecting how galactic structure looks like because it will actually start smearing galactic structures. You are not going to be allowed actually to have very small galaxies anymore because at some point you actually will not be able to bind them with such dark matter. So uh, if the dark matter right now, the limit is about 10 to the minus 22, 22 electron volts from observation. So I wanted to show you before we actually continue with our blackboard test, blackboard lecture, uh, as to what possible kind of scenarios do we have here with dark matter. And uh, here are kind of what we are looking at right now, the ultralight dark matter. That's a very nice slide from Andre Long. So we are looking at about the scale of above one or 10 AV, and I will also, we will get to the point as to why, besides the fact that it has to be bosonic, what else is different in terms of detection? We'll get to that point. Here you have your WIMP, CERVIMP, Zillus, and so on. Uh, but as you see, the scale of masses is daunting. So from this side, you're limited by the galactic observations. 
Uh, but the astrophysics test can tell the difference below 10 to the minus 18 electron volts. So we can improve those uh, galactic structure type of uh, astrophysical observations for dark matter limits, but if it's above 10 to the minus 18 electron volts, you cannot tell the difference uh, in this case, whether it's a particle dark matter or wave-like dark matter from astrophysics alone. You, you have, you know, other astrophysical type of tests, but not from the large-scale galactic structures. So for now, the dark matter, the 100% dark matter is actually limited only by 10 to the minus 22 EV from astrophysics and from the Planck mass at this point, because, well, what happens if your particle has a, exceeds a Planck mass? It becomes a black hole. So, but there is no reason why you can't have heavy dark matter, just have to be composite. And here is a very nice cartoon, if you haven't seen it before, I'm just going to let you stare at it for a while. So primordial black holes have not been fully ruled out, but mostly ruled out, space cows have been not. And like, uh, I mean, our entire kind of dark matter searches, and this actually, this is not true. The actions can actually be all the way down to the 10 to minus 8, 20, uh, 22. It really makes a difference whether your uh, PKQ transition is before or after the inflation, so. Okay, so that's kind of where we're at with dark matter. <laughs> So for those people who would like to find dark matter, and like if I want to know, answer the one question, I want to know what the dark matter is in my lifetime. So that's actually be fantastic. Uh, there've been more effort to rule out black holes. The primordial black holes, who knows what the primordial black hole is first? Raise your hand. Okay, so primordial black hole, it's a black hole which have never been a star. It was produced uh, at early universe. You can actually, all you need to do is produce black hole. You don't need stars. You just need to pack a lot of matter into very small volume. Inflation can do that for you, actually. So, so you can actually do, can have quantum fluctuations which actually produce those at inflation, and we are kind of just stuck with them afterwards. The reason why this just recently resurfaced is because LIGO have been look, actually finding surprisingly large black holes, even though, of course, there is a statistic bias because it's easier for LIGO to see large black hole mergers. But they've seen at least one which can't, should not have been directly uh, produced. That's kind of why this resurfaced, but it's very likely it's been produced by two previous mergers. So if you're interested, there's a limit on, uh, there is a certain a limit when you actually initiate power pr pair production large stars, you can actually not allow to have black holes of certain size because of this but there is nothing prevents you of having titratory system. Two stars merge, there is unusually large black hole, and then when the second merges, it looks like it was too large, but it wasn't, just because it's already a result of the merge. So as you see, we actually are fairly clueless on the mass of dark matter, and the reason why we're clueless is because previously we thought dark matter has to solve some other problem, because wouldn't it be nice if you solve two problems with the same particle, right? Your hierarchy problem and dark matter could be solved by WIMPs. The also hierarchy problem and the dark matter can be solved by relaxing. So, and the another question is, uh, could we actually have dark matter as a single ultralight particle? And the answer is yes. It's possible that dark matter, it's an uh, act 10 to the minus six EV axion, or it's for example, 10 to the minus 15 EV scalar, and that's it. So you could actually, with a 10 to the minus 11 EV relaxion, you can solve both the hierarchy problem and dark matter and have nothing at the TV scale at all. So it's, uh, there are loopholes in that scenario, but it's not impossible. I really, really hope that we have a TV scale of physics, uh, but uh, as I said, you can actually get without it in principle. So it's possible that entire dark matter is ultralight only. Also, there could be a, a huge number of ultralight particles for various reasons, and there could be a whole spectrum of those, and they eventually make 100% dark matter. It will be very, very hard to prove that new particle which you found is 100% dark matter. People will have to really think how to do that. But for now, we just want to find one. Okay, and uh, we were talking about the wavelengths of dark matter. 
So let's discuss what do we actually mean by that, what do we mean by coherence, and uh, uh, eventually what are the consequences of the fact that dark matter is ultralight for detection purposes. And here where I actually would like you to make uh, an exercise, and we will then uh, work it out together. Let's say that you have a single dark matter particle with a mass of 10 to the minus six electron volt. What I would like you to compute it's a Compton frequency. The Compton wavelengths. And the reason why it's important, because in tomorrow's lecture, we will see that ultralight dark matter oscillates at the Compton wavelengths. This is actually a way to get its mass. And then uh, de Broglie wavelengths. And just to make things easy for you, here is a very important relation, which means you don't have to look up anything. HC, it's approximately 200 electron volts by nanometer. And then you don't need any more constants except the speed of light, which is 310 to the uh, 10 centimeters. Just in case you forgot the formulas, and the Broglie wavelengths, it's the same thing, only with V. I would like you to actually get the numbers. Uh, and if you're done, then do the same thing for uh, 10 to the minus 12 electron volt. And the brave person who is done, come here and write it down. And that's for the 10 to the minus 6 EV. And write the answers for 10 to the minus 12 EV. And using this, that's, and, and the speed of light should be enough. The speed of light uh, just takes 3, 10 to the 10 centimeters per second. That should be enough. Oh, and uh, usually phrase this one as 2 pi multiplied at something in, in like hertz. Because generally that's how the uh, frequency, the angular frequency is determined. If you're done, go and write them out. People, let, let them through. If you're not sure what to do, raise your hand and I'll come to you. Just to say, 10 to the minus 6 is one of the really preferred mass for the axions. And this exercise I worked out in the book with a lot of many, many other things. <clears throat> oh, uh, V, uh, we had discussed this, but uh, I can just take 10 to the minus 3C. So the velocity, as I said, uh, it's a 10 to the minus 3C which is, as I said, 300 kilometers per second, that's a VRL distribution for the dark matter. Also, this is actually very similar to 130 kilometers, uh, uh, kilometers per second. That's the speed with which sun actually flies through dark matter because sun rotates around the galactic center and velocity is about 130 kilometers per second. For purposes, dark matter is very supported, but kind of not rotating, at least according to the current model. Could be a bit, but we don't know. So it assumes there is a dark matter, kind of a wind. So essentially we move through it and it kind of blows in our hair. Both of those things will produce uh, about 10 to the minus three dispersion for the velocity.
Anyone done? Go and write it down. I'm going to wait until somebody goes to write an answer on the board, but I know plug-in numbers is very difficult. As, as, as physicists, we are just frequently write formulas, but eventually one has to plug numbers. So I know people who can like literally do just stuff like on napkins uh, in, in their heads uh, and get right results. This is a, um, a, a very, very nice uh, ability to estimate stuff. Oh, I'll get out of your way. You can check the answer to it with your neighbor. And if you're, okay. Yes, yes, uh, the mass is right, absolutely. That is uh, C squared, yes. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, and I usually live in a, in a world of atomic units and don't use natural units, but uh, uh, for the purposes of this uh, lecture-ish. I, I assume I'm going to have EV is, of course, C squared. Yes. If you are done, then first come and write it and then find out how many bosons actually do you get per de Broglie volume. That's a little bit more involved. I will do it on the board. So if you're done, go and write it down. But there is a next question is, here is a de Broglie volume. How many of them are in there? I see a number of people done. Go write an answer. A brave soul. As a physicist, it's important to actually know that you are right. Even, I mean, if you're not, you'll, you'll get corrected. Don't worry about it. Perfect. This is why we have archive. People, we all post papers in archive and wait for a little while just to see that people can comment on it just in case people got something wrong. Some papers never actually make it to publication because people find a fault with it and just email the others. Uh, okay, so this one is. So this is just the lambda. So this, yeah, this we usually would like to actually do with two pi's, but here we just want like in centimeters. Okay, so in centimeters it's one point three. So because the. Uh, Go ahead, so right this there. This formula is just with an h, right? Not an h bar. Not h bar. This is with h, yeah, yes. So I multiply by two pi. Okay. A couple of orders of magnitude. I think you divided the other way. So it's, is it, uh, would it be kilometers? 130 uh, centimeters. It's, I, I got 130. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, I divide by 10. So it's much okay. Much. And what about the Broglie wavelengths? Uh, the Broglie one would just be that times 1,000. Yeah, okay. So like 10 to the 5. Yeah, yeah so basically it's 1.78 kilometers. Yep. And the frequency? 
Okay. Okay. Uh, this is fine. This, this is good. We all get it up. Did you get the other one? Stand to minus 12? Uh, no, I did not. Okay. Uh, anyone else go and write the frequency? Thank you so much, uh, our first brave volunteer. So the answer is 130 centimeters for the Compton wavelengths. And then uh, the, in order to compute 10 to the minus 12, all you have to do is just look how it scales with mass and either multiply or divide by 10 to the minus 12. So anyone else actually got the frequency? Go ahead, write it down. I see a number of people stopped writing, so. Tell me, the, tell me the number. What? Yes, 1.5 10 to the 9 hertz, this is correct. So if we separate the two pi, that will become actually 240 megahertz. Uh, but the answer is yes, it's 1 to the 5, 10 to the 9 hertz. So in megahertz, this is going to be that. Because there is some distinction when people say hertz or seconds, hertz assume you separate out to pi, but most people don't do that. But I've been, it's been pointed to me by my experimental colleagues a number of times. So, okay, uh, excellent. So this is a result. And in order to get, uh, so first, are there any questions how is also obtained? So let me, let me write this down. And believe me, when you work with experimentalists, being able to actually get down to numbers, it's very important. Okay, so let's actually write this down. So the lambda, uh, let's start with frequency. So the frequency, mc squared c h bar c. Because the frequency itself, so the frequency is actually mc squared divided by the h bar. And we would like h bar because actually we would like to get the two pi out. So here we have uh, actually h bar c, and the h bar c is this 200 eV uh, nanometer. And that's why actually that was given. So here we actually have 10 to the minus 6 eV. Here we have 3, 10 to the 10 centimeters. And here we have 200 eV per nanometer. Nanometer is 10 to the minus 7 centimeter. And uh, eV goes away. Uh, in this case, uh, no, I'm uh, second, yeah, okay. And then uh, EV is going away, centimeters go away, so you're one of a second, which makes perfect sense for the frequency. And if you put all numbers together, this is 1.5, 10 to the nine, one over second. And if you would like to actually put it in Hertz, then separate out as a two pi, and this is 240 megahertz, 10 to the six, okay. That's why H bar was given, H bar C. And then for the wavelengths, <coughs> uh, question? Okay, so for the wavelengths, you will get two pi, three to the 10 centimeters, divided by the, uh, your Compton, Frequency and this 10 to the 9, S minus 1. This is about 130 centimeters. And this one, you just simply have to multiply by 10 to the 3 because it's 10 to the minus, divide by the uh, C or V, so divide by 10 to the minus 3, so you get 10 to the 3. And now for the mass of 10 to the minus 12 EV, all we have to do is just sort out how they scale. So the lambda C. This is proportional to the mass. The lambda is proportional to one over omega, so proportional to inverse of the mass. Therefore, this will scale, and you will get actually two pi, 
Now 240 hertz, not megahertz. Because you have to divide by 10 to the minus 6. This one you have to multiply by 10 to the minus 6. So you get 10 to the 6 kilometers. And remember the Earth's diameter, it's only 1,200 kilometers. So now you have a Compton wavelength exceeding the Earth's diameter significantly. And the De Broglie wavelength is even bigger, so De Broglie wavelength is 10 to the 9 kilometer. <clears throat> and now the next question is, how many of those bosons do you actually have per De Broglie volume? And uh, that will leave us to actually a very interesting conclusion. I would say that at about 10 AV, you'll have one particle per de Broglie volume because that's where we started from, remember? So when we were computing the Fermion versus Boson limit, we found that 10 AV, you get one. Let's see how many of them will actually get at 10 to the minus six. First, are there any questions on this computation? Remember those numbers. Important point that this has a scale of the Compton wavelengths at which is actually, by the way, it's oscillate, we'll discuss why, at the scale of about this. At 10 to the 12, it actually oscillates on a scale exceeding the Earth's radius. The one consequence would be that such ultralight dark matter is coherent on the scale of detectors or networks of detectors or the entire galaxy. And we'll talk about what coherence actually lengths mean in that actual regard. But first, let's see how many of them do we get per de Broglie volume at 10 to the minus 6 CV or 10 to the minus 12 CV. Because that will make all the difference. So the first, remember that our kinetic energy for our dark matter is much smaller than its mass term, just because velocity at 10 to the minus 3c, right? So for all purposes, when we're actually computing the number of particles, all we have to do is just get our dark matter density per de Broglie volume and divide, divide by the mass. That's all it is. That's a simple estimate because we only have to care about the mass term. You can, if you're not sure where this comes from, check the dimensions just to get, it's always good to check when you deal with densities and number densities, you get dimension right that you actually uh, get the volume correctly separated and the mass correctly separated. And in this case, your uh, density is in uh, mass units per the Volume units, that's in volume units, that's in mass units. So all the units go away, so you get the right units here. So, and uh, let's plug the numbers. So 0.4 GeV per centimeter cubed multiplied by 1.3 10 to the 5 centimeter cubed. So that's your de Broglie wavelengths, which you just computed. Uh, if you did put the mass 10 to the minus 6 electron volts for now. And then we're dividing this by mass 10 to the minus 6 electron volt. This is 10 to the 30. You have 10 to the 30 particles per de Broglie volume at 10 to the minus 6. If you plug in 10 to the minus 12 electron volts, you get 10 to the 54 particle per de Broglie volume. So we are not in Kansas anymore. We are no longer detecting dark matter by particle hitting something and scattering of it. Because you have 10 to the 30 of them for axions. However, what happens when your occupational numbers are that large? That thing, it's simply a cosine wave. 
And tomorrow we will actually look at the Lagrangian and essentially you see that your scalar field solution is a solution for the Klein-Gordon equation. All it is, it's just a cosine field. Therefore, we are looking at interaction of your detector with a classical wave. And in this case, also, your dark matter is coherent, and we'll talk about coherence lengths at this point next, on a scale of either your detector or the entire solar system. And this is why we are detecting those things with quantum sensors. Because if you write down, and we will do so, all possible ways such a thing, such a wave, can actually couple to the standard model, then you're either coupling it linearly, quadratically, or through the derivative of the field. Or you can make more complicated coupling, but you can write down, even if you don't know what it is, it's still the scalar, the scalar vector, of the vector, and people ran out of interest afterwards, and no one much looked for tensors dark matter, I have to say. But generally, people look for scalars, of the scalars, and vectors. Vectors is what's referred to as dark photons. The most famous the scalar would be the QCD axions, and the scalars would be dilaton, relaxion, moduli, and all those other things. And uh, in this case, you can look at the what possible effect happens to the standard model particles if you couple your scalars, pseudo scalars or vectors to your standard model Lagrangian. And uh, there are several effects which those things will do and we'll explain tomorrow why. They will be actually make all the fields, all the spins precess. So one effect which such dark matter causes are precessions of electronic and nuclear spins. The second effect, and we'll see tomorrow how, i give you a little preview, it will actually make all the fundamental constants and all the masses oscillate. Because you just multiply your entire Lagrangian for the standard model by an oscillating wave. And by the way, we'll see it oscillates at the Compton frequency. It will also cause this violation of equivalence principle test because there's no reason why you're coupling that thing the same way to electrons, protons, and neutrons. And since your atoms have different number of electron, protons, or neutrons, such coupling automatically violates equivalence principle. It also make, therefore, uh, possible all of that depends on the gravitational wave potential. Also, it makes all the solid bodies lengths oscillate as well because the fundamental constants oscillate. Also, it will induce electromagnetic fields because there is essentially uh, uh, a way you can actually couple all of this to either produce photons directly, you can actually produce photons out of axions, or you can actually uh, affect electromagnetic fields and cavities. So there are going to be, as therefore, effects which cause magnetic fields, electric fields, create photons, or change the energy levels of anything. Because if your fundamental constants oscillate, so do every single energy level on atoms, molecules, nucleus, everything. And then you see why we're looking at those things with quantum sensors, because that's what magnetometers, atom interferometers, clocks, and cavities do. They measure all of these effects. Magnetometry specifically looks at spin precession, atom interferometry at VEP tests and accelerations, and clocks at the energy levels. So that's why there is numerous methods to detect such kind of dark matter, all with quantum sensors. It's because now you're actually looking at something which has a wavelength span of your detector or Earth, or the solar system, or the galaxy. And you have that many particles. When your axion hits a nuclei, nuclei will never know about it. There is no energy deposition to look at. So all of those things are pretty much invisible by uh, all the di direction dark matter experiments. Also, I would like to say that all of those quantum <clears throat> type of experiments are actually direct detection experiments. You see the signal at the Compton frequency of your dark matter. And I'll show you how. So you can actually determine the dark matter wavelengths from those experiments. And if you have multiple particles, you'll see mul multiple signals. So, first questions about it, and then we'll talk about coherence issues.
Okay. And the next exercise. So now we talked about the uh, basic properties. So we already mentioned that we oscillate the Compton frequency. Tomorrow we'll write down the Lagrangian with the equations and see how that actually works. But uh, as I said, the basic idea, you write down your Lagrangian, which is a Lorentz invariant. You add the mass term because we know there has to be a mass and you end up with a just simple solution of uh, pretty much plane wave, which we all know and love. And now the coherence. As I said, the dark matter is V-realized, so it's not actually high, it has uh, non-zero mass and it has non-zero velocity. Therefore, there is dispersion. Therefore, your coherence is not perfect. But let's see at which point it remains coherent. And when I say coherent, think about that you have many, many of your dark matter waves within the coherence volume. For all the purposes of detection, this is a single wave. And that's actually what we call the coherent length. In the coherence time, it's, pro it's just a time corresponding to that length. That's all that is. So let's compute what it actually is. What's the characteristic coherence time and length of ultralight dark matter field? So uh, ultralight dark matter is cold. So if you write your standard kinetic term, let me actually uh, just not use this. So you have mc squared and the kinetic term one half mv squared. Right now we cannot omit that because that's what we look, want to look at. And the v, it's about 10 to the minus 3c still. So now what is the change of energy during to this? That's it's about one half mass at delta v squared. So the change of energy means that distribution isn't perfect, so there is dispersion. And that's just due to velocity. And in this case, uh, be, let's actually make sure that we get this in either frequency units or the energy units. This is delta V squared divided by the 2C squared. Uh, because now when they actually divide it by E, we can forget about this term and just MC squared and there is one half coming from here and the mass goes away. And uh, this is about 10 to the 6 C squared. So the Q factor of your dark matter is essentially 10 to the 6. So what does it mean? It means that after 10 to the 6 oscillation, dark matter dephases. So the phase differences become actually uh, therefore reach one. So in this case, you can assume that you're no longer within the same coherence volume. And uh, experimentally, you actually have to account for it. So generally, you can actually keep accumulating the data within coherence volume. And uh, if you look at what you should do, you should actually measure for several coherence volumes. So what is actually coherent length? So let's first actually compute the coherence time. So coherence time, it's defined therefore by just 10 to the 6, 2 pi in your frequency, because uh, we just computed what is the frequency range here. And therefore, the coherent length is defined by just the velocity, which 10 to the minus 3c, multiplied by coherence times. And uh, if you actually look what it is, it's equal to de Broglie wavelengths. So it's very easy. The coherence length is just the de Broglie wavelengths, which kind of makes sense, right? Because essentially, while you're within the same de Broglie volume, you actually remain coherent. Now, let's put some numerical estimates. Uh, let's say m is about 10 to the minus 6. So let's plug 10 to the minus 6 to pi. And remember, we already got the frequency. This is 2 pi 240 megahertz. So it remains coherent if it's 10 to the minus 3 for about 4 milliseconds, which is not big, but that's OK. And the coherent length in this case, we already know uh, it's 130 centimeters. 
So it's a coherent on the scale of microwave cavity, which makes perfect sense for the detection purposes. However, if it's 10 to the minus 12, let's plug it right here. If it's 10 to the minus 12, it's 400, 4,000 seconds. It's coherent for more than an hour. An hour is actually enough for the modern clocks. Modern clocks can reach 10 to the minus 18, 18 accuracy in nine seconds. So you could be actually measuring within the coherence volume already at the maximum sensitivity for the modern clocks. So in the coherent lengths, therefore, for 10 to the minus 12 electron volts, uh, is therefore 130 multiplied by uh, 10 to the 6. So this is 10 to the... Ten to the eleven centimeters. So this is about a million kilometers. So it's coherent on a scale exceeding Earth to Moon distance. Earth to Moon distance is about three hundred eighty thousand kilometers. And for the ten to the minus twenty two electron volts, it's coherent for the ten to the thirteen seconds. So that's above the graduate student time on your lab. <laughs> So at that point, actually, you're within the same coherence volume. And it all sounds great, and for the most part, people assume this, that it's coherent. However, there's been a recent paper which took forever to actually get refereed. It was an archive for like two years because it was a, such an unusual idea. Think about um, so whether it's actually truly coherence or a stochastic. Think about of what wave actually is. Wave has an amplitude, right? So we could generally assume that you're looking for the maximum amplitude of the wave. But what if you're not there? What if you're like right here? So in principle, people have simulated how it actually looks like when you keep measuring why this wave was oscillating. And the result is that if you're actually measuring, you should measure it for several coherence volumes to be able to sample the entire property. So which is perfectly fine for the axion test when it turns to minus six, you have to start worrying when you're actually looking for the very, very light dark matter. Uh, and in this case, your sensitivity goes down by about the factor of three if you're actually out you know, less than one coherence volume in this case. So it's just something to be considered. But for the purpose of detection, we are now detecting a wave and not a particle, which has extremely large occupational number per de Broglie volume. And uh, in this case, that's why we are considering quantum sensors. And I just would like to summarize as to what type of quantum sensors we actually would use. And then we'll consider more theory tomorrow and look why actually it's causing all of those effects. So your dark matter would, oh, it would process nuclear electronic spins, drive currents, electromagnetic systems, produce photons, induce equivalence principle violating accelerations of matter, and modulate the waves of fundamental constants. That would induce changes in all transition frequency, local gravitational field, and literally affect the name of the body. Like this table length oscillates because of this. Just very little. And uh, therefore, if you look at the list of quantum sensors, magnetometers, microwave cavities, trapped ions, actually other qubits, uh, people have been using various uh, quantum information devices for it, atom interferometers, laser interferometers, optical cavities, atomic molecule, nuclear clock, other precision spectroscopy, all of those stuff in my definition are quantum sensors, and all of those as of now are being used to actually search for dark matter because our entire range of uh, under a few EV, it's accessible to those devices because as you see, uh, the number density goes up extremely quickly. So tomorrow we'll actually see why those things happen. So we'll specifically talk about why it would modulate the values of fundamental constants and look specifically how to actually detect those things with atomic clocks. And then later we'll talk about axioms. And um, I will also have a separate introduction of how atomic clocks work. Like why do we care? We care because specific clock operation limits you of which dark matter ranges can you detect. Because when you do detection with quantum sensor, even particle theorists have to have some understanding how those technologies work.
because clocks have characteristic probe times. And it matters how many dark mode oscillations you get during the clock probe times. It also matters how quickly clocks can actually integrate and uh, get down to the ultimate systematics uh, and statistics. It, so the type of sensor in this case matters. And as if, for example, you have to understand uh, how dark matter can be produced in LHC and how it detected with a, for example, foreign facility. Here you have to have, have some minimal understanding how those things work. So we'll talk a little bit how atomic clocks work tomorrow. Thank you so much for your attention. We'll reconvene at 4.30 for the discussion section. Think about questions and please, please ask questions. Okay, and you're welcome to just come and talk to me now uh, if you have questions on that lecture, okay? Thank you so much. If you <laughs>